Mona Lisa, one of the most renowned paintings in history, owes its fame not just to its captivating smile, but to the genius of Leonardo da Vinci, who mastered human anatomy like no artist before him. To capture that enigmatic smile, Leonardo went beyond the canvas. He dissected human bodies, peeling back the layers of skin to uncover every nerve and muscle that contributed to facial expressions. He followed the advice of Renaissance polymath Leon Battista Alberti, who believed that an artist should envision the human body from the inside out, starting with the skeleton, moving to the muscles and skin, and finally to the clothing. Leonardo's relentless pursuit of knowledge blurred the lines between science and art. When he wrote to the Duke of Milan seeking employment, he didn't highlight his artistic brilliance. Instead, he emphasized his engineering expertise, detailing designs for bridges, cannons, and even tanks. Only as an afterthought did he mention that he could paint. Yet, this was the essence of Leonardo, an artist, a scientist, an engineer, and above all, a man of insatiable curiosity. Leonardo's curiosity knew no bounds. Among his thousands of pages of notes are seemingly random thoughts, like a question about how to describe the tongue of a woodpecker. This relentless drive to question, observe, an experiment made him a visionary whose brilliance has yet to be rivaled. Born on April 15, 1452, in Anciano, a small village near Vinci, Italy, Leonardo was the illegitimate son of Ser Piero, a wealthy notary, and Caterina, a local peasant woman. Walter Isaacson, in his biography of Leonardo, points out that his illegitimacy was, in a way, a stroke of luck. Had he been legitimate, he might have been forced into his father's profession as a notary, stifling his creative genius. Instead, Leonardo spent his early years with his mother and later with his paternal grandparents, while his father worked in Florence. After the death of his stepmother, Leonardo moved to Florence at the age of 12 to live with his father. Florence, at the time, was the beating heart of the Renaissance art world, a city where creativity thrived. Yet, because of his illegitimacy, Leonardo wasn't sent to a formal Latin school like other boys of his status. Instead, he attended an abacus school where he learned practical mathematics for commerce. He struggled with Latin his entire life. His writing was primarily in Italian, and as a left-handed individual, he developed a peculiar habit. He often wrote from right to left to prevent smudging the ink. This backward writing became his signature, and when others mocked him for his lack of formal education, he confidently dismissed them as foolish folk. Though I cannot quote from authors as they do, I shall rely on a far more worthy thing, on experience. His words reflected his belief that true knowledge came not from books, but from observation and hands-on learning. At just 14, Leonardo began an apprenticeship arranged by his father with one of his clients, renowned artist Andrea del Verrocchio. In Verrocchio's workshop, young Leonardo studied with intensity, particularly drawn to the lifelike veins and muscles in Verrocchio's sculpture of David. This became his first lesson in the subtle art of motion, but it was in his later masterpiece, The Last Supper, that he would truly perfect this skill. In this iconic painting, the apostles react with intense emotion to Jesus' shocking announcement of betrayal. The figures are grouped in threes, and each one moves with emotion, gesturing, turning, expressing disbelief and sorrow. Judas, the betrayer, is cloaked in shadow, clutching the silver he was given to betray Jesus, leaning away from the others, his guilt tangible. Leonardo's genius began to shine even brighter in Verrocchio's workshop. It's believed that Leonardo painted the radiant fish in Tobias and the Angel, which contrasts starkly with Antonio del Pagliolo's duller depiction. Similarly, Leonardo's prancing dog at the bottom left is far more animated and lively compared to Pagliolo's rigid portrayal. It was soon clear that Leonardo had surpassed his master. In the Baptism of Christ, the angel Leonardo painted on the left is more dynamic than Verrocchio's angel on the right. Using the revolutionary sfumato technique, Leonardo blended tones around the angel's jawline, creating a soft, seamless transition of light and shadow, an effect that contrasted sharply with Verrocchio's more defined edges. In 1477, Leonardo opened his own workshop, eager to 
step out of his master's shadow. Yet, despite his growing fame, commissions were few, and many of his projects were left unfinished. This became a trademark of his career. Many handsome young men worked and lived under his roof, including John Giacomo Caprati, known as Salai, nicknamed Little Devil for his mischievous nature. It's widely believed that Leonardo shared a close, possibly romantic relationship with Salai. After five long, frustrating years with little to show for his efforts, Lorenzo de' Medici, the ruler of Florence, saw an opportunity for Leonardo. He sent the struggling artist on a diplomatic mission to present a lyre, a musical instrument Leonardo had mastered, to Ludovico Sforza, the Duke of Milan. But Leonardo, ever the opportunist, seized this moment not only to present his musical gift, but to offer his engineering expertise in a famous letter to the Duke. The Duke, impressed by the scope of Leonardo's skills, accepted his offer, and Leonardo soon found himself in Milan under Ludovico's patronage for the next 17 years. During during this time, Leonardo was invited to advise on several architectural projects, including the design for the central dome of the Milan Cathedral, one of the largest and most awe-inspiring Gothic cathedrals in Europe. Although his design was not ultimately chosen, it was here that Leonardo applied his profound understanding of proportion and symmetry, principles he immortalized in the Vitruvian Man. Leonardo believed that the proportions of the human body could serve as a model for architectural design. He drew his inspiration from the Roman architect Vitruvius, who, in the first century BC, described the ideal proportions of the human body. The length of the foot is one-sixth of the height of the body. Vitruvius also explained that the man's navel serves as the central point of the body, and with arms and legs outstretched, a circle could be drawn around the body, while the height and arm span together form a perfect square. While other artists have attempted to recreate the Vitruvian man, None have captured the perfect harmony of artistic beauty and scientific precision that Leonardo achieved. Leonardo's fascination with the male form is evident in his many anatomical studies and drawings, which often focused on the male body. One of his more unusual observations even reads, when a man sits down, the distance from his seat to the top part of his head will be half of his height plus the thickness and length of the testicles. Leonardo's dedication to understanding the human body was un paralleled. He dissected around 30 corpses, producing meticulously detailed, scientifically accurate renderings of the human form. In one of his skull drawings, Leonardo illustrated the internal structure by cutting the skull in half, revealing the frontal sinus behind the eyebrows. This was a groundbreaking discovery, as the understanding of human anatomy at the time was woefully limited. Leonardo's greatest achievements in understanding the human body came through his study of the heart. He demonstrated that the heart is not merely a pump but a muscle. He also made groundbreaking suggestions about the aging process, including that arteries harden over time. More impressively, he discovered the swirling currents of blood in the aorta, which helped heart valves close properly. But Leonardo's obsession with motion wasn't confined to the heart. It extended to his studies of water. Water fascinated Leonardo, especially its destructive power. His drawings of deluges depict apocalyptic scenes, capturing the sheer force of nature at its most violent. To Leonardo, water was a force to be reckoned with, and in his mind, controlled. He envisioned ways to divert the Arno River, cutting off Florence's enemy, Pisa, from the sea by building massive dams. He even designed a machine capable of moving a million tons of earth to redirect the water into a ditch, demonstrating his understanding of engineering on a monumental scale. But water wasn't the only force that caught his attention. Leonardo also set his sights on conquering the skies for decades. He studied how birds fly, making detailed observations such as, there are some birds that move their wings more swiftly when they lower them than when they raise them, as Walter Isaacson pointed out. We rarely make the effort in our daily lives to observe ordinary phenomena so closely. Leonardo's vision of flight led to the creation of the Ornithopter, a conceptual aircraft designed to fly by flapping its wings, a precursor to modern aviation. He also sketched the aerial screw, a design for an early helicopter with a spiral rotor intended to lift the machine off the ground. But despite his ingenuity, 15th century technology was simply too primitive to bring his dreams to life. In other areas, however, particularly in map making, Leonardo's innovations had an immediate and lasting impact. In 1502, in his 50s, Leonardo became the chief military architect and engineer to the ruthless Cesare Borgia 
the son of Pope Alexander VI. It was during this time that Leonardo's skills in map making became evident. His most significant contribution was the creation of a highly accurate map of Imola, a key city in Borja's military campaign. Maps during this period were often symbolic and more often than not inaccurate. But Leonardo changed that. Using a magnetic compass, he created scientifically precise maps, allowing Borja to plan attacks, identify weak points, and position troops with unmatched efficiency. This was the birth of modern cartography. Before his work with Borja, Leonardo's talents as a military engineer had often been overlooked, but now his genius was beginning to shine in full force. The Duke of Milan primarily valued Leonardo for his artistic brilliance, which truly shone through in one of his most iconic works. In 1495, Leonardo began painting the Last Supper on the wall of a small church and monastery in the heart of Milan. Some days, he worked tirelessly from dawn until dusk, ignoring food or drink, consumed entirely by his work. On other days, however, he would leave his paintbrush untouched, lost in thought, waiting for inspiration. One of the most remarkable aspects of The Last Supper is Leonardo's mastery of linear perspective. All the architectural lines converge at a single vanishing point located at Jesus' forehead, an ingenious way of drawing the viewer's gaze directly to Christ, underscoring his pivotal role in the scene. To create this precise perspective, Leonardo hammered a small nail into the center of the wall just by Jesus' head and made thin incisions to guide the lines. Here's something fascinating. If you stand on the left side of the room, it almost feels like the painting spills out into the real space, as though you're part of the scene itself. Beyond the visual mastery, Leonardo imbued the Last Supper with an extraordinary emotional depth. The painting captures the charged moment when Christ announces, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. Each apostle's thoughts and emotions are conveyed through their gestures and expressions. As Leonardo once said, a picture of human figures ought to be done in such a way that the viewer may easily recognize, by means of their attitudes, the intentions of their minds. This is not just a depiction. It's an invitation into the heart of the moment. But it took a different kind of ambition to mold and cast a massive bronze horse, towering at seven meters, or 23 feet. Leonardo spent years designing this monumental statue commissioned by the Duke of Milan to honor his late father. He studied horses in meticulous detail, creating a massive clay model to bring his vision to life. However, in 1494, the bronze intended for the statue was instead redirected to create cannons to defend Milan from the advancing French forces. Tragically, the French troops, when they eventually invaded, destroyed the clay model, using it as target practice. Ironically, it would be the French who would later become some of Leonardo's greatest supporters. After the Duke of Milan was overthrown in 1499, Leonardo spent over a decade wandering across Italy, searching for a new patron, until finally he found the support of the French crown. In 1516, King Francis I invited Leonardo to his court, recognizing and appreciating his beautiful mind. Leonardo spent the rest of his life in a red brick manor next to the king's castle in the Loire Valley, where he obsessively refined his most famous work. The Mona Lisa is widely believed to depict Lisa Gerardini, the wife of a wealthy Florentine silk merchant. Leonardo's knowledge as both a scientist and an artist culminated in the Mona Lisa, his mastery of sfumato, the technique of blending tones to create soft transitions without harsh edges, gave the painting its lifelike quality. His profound understanding of light and shadow, especially how they interact with curved surfaces, allowed him to create subtle, realistic details like the play of light across her face. The illusion that her eyes follow the viewer is a result of Leonardo's precise use of linear perspective and shading. He meticulously modeled the shadows around her eyes, giving them depth and expression. As Leonardo once said, the eye which is said to be the window of the soul was the key to his approach in capturing emotion by painting her eyes to look directly at the viewer. And since perspective in a two-dimensional painting doesn't change, they seem to follow you wherever you go. The most fascinating feature of the painting, her enigmatic smile, changes depending on where you focus, 
reflecting Leonardo's understanding of visual perception. When viewed directly, the fine details and subtle shading around her mouth make her smile seem less pronounced. But when seen in your peripheral vision, broader shapes and contrasts come into play, making her smile appear more prominent. The artistic and scientific mastery in the Mona Lisa becomes even more apparent when compared to one of Leonardo's earlier works, Ginevra de Bensi, which, while impressive, lacks the same emotional depth and technical sophistication. The Mona Lisa was in his studio when Leonardo died. In the final years of his life, Leonardo became captivated by the destructive power of water. His deluge drawings depict apocalyptic visions of nature's overwhelming force as he faced his own mortality. Leonardo da Vinci passed away on May 2nd, 1519, at the age of 67, possibly due to a stroke. Though he was not known to be religious, in his will, Leonardo wrote, and first he commends his soul to our Lord, Almighty God, and to the glorious Virgin Mary. Leonardo da Vinci's life and work represent the perfect balance between art and science. Science informed his art, and his art brought the beauty and complexity of science to life. What's remarkable is that he was largely self-taught. His boundless curiosity and intense observation of the world around him gave him an education that he didn't get from a classroom.